thank you very much. I'll take this off. Yeah. Um, Okay, thank you very much. So uh, I will uh, today uh, talk to you about the uh, probably the most famous and most important, considered the most important uh, open problem in mathematics, the Riemann hypothesis. Uh, and well, there are a, a lot of surprises uh, when um, about this. This is, uh, uh, of course, one of the linear price problems. Uh, so it's worth one billion dollars if you. Uh, if you if you solve it, <laughs> uh, so there we have uh, this. This is uh, this. The Riemann hypothesis is 162 years old, and this is where uh, it is made in Riemann's original paper. So this is uh, in Germany. But basically, uh, what he says is that well, it seems that I've uh, I've made some computation. It seems that all the the roots. Well, uh, I'll I'll speak about the the hypothesis later, but. It seems that all the roots are here, but this is really not relevant for the problem at hand. And so this is just a, a kind of a margin, not, well, not marginal, but uh, half a dozen lines uh, about uh, in which he states uh, what is still a hypothesis uh, 162 years later. So, uh, Okay. 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 It seems that. Okay. Now that's thanks. Uh, right. So, um, well, uh, first of all, uh, let me tell you about the, the prime number theorem because this is the problem which we meant to solve in that that uh, in that paper. It is a 12 page paper. So if you look at uh, the number of page, of number of primes, uh, if you make a, 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 count, a count of uh, the number of primes up to x and you plot this function, the copy function, this is something of a, a step function like this. Okay? So it has some, uh, uh, of course, it has a steps, it has steps at every time, at every, uh, at every prime. Yes. You have a staircase of primes, and if you look at the distance, this seems to, I mean, the, the roughness at the edges uh, sort of stops being visible. And uh, in fact, uh, a, a specific curve seems to, to occur. And Gauss, at the age of 15, conjectured that this uh, curve was, uh, was x over log x. Uh, in fact, uh, later. Very sorry about this. Uh... It's... Okay. Uh, in fact, later uh, this uh, this uh, estimate was uh, later refined by himself with this function L i of x, the logarithm integral uh, of x, which is just this. So, in fact, um, these two functions are asymptotic, uh, asymptotically equal. So, this is this. I mean, uh, the, the counting function is asymptotic to this one and to this one. So. Uh, but why did he care to put the law integral of x? Because, uh, as you see, I mean, these are asymptotic to the counting function. Both are asymptotic to the counting function, uh, meaning that the, the ratio of, uh, uh, of the function. Uh, so we have to find a, figure out a better way to do this in future. Agora vai ser difícil. Isto. On on Spanish participants. Okay. In the way. Very sorry about this. Okay, so uh, this is the prime number theory, which is which was proved by finally by Hadamard and the Ballet Poussin in, in at the end of the 19th century. The prime counting function is asymptotic to both this one. So it's asymptotic to one so it's automatically to the other. Okay, so after this problem, uh, because this is the problem Riemann set up to solve, uh, let me uh, let me go back to the 18th century and to Euler. Uh, so uh, Euler, in fact, uh, was the first one who worked with the zeta function, 
And uh, he did that um, because, well, because of this, uh, as you may know, he became famous in 1736 when he, uh, when he solved the puzzle problem, which was summing the squares, the inverse squares, and that is the result. In fact, later, uh, he did much more. I mean, he actually uh, computed, uh, calculated the values of the, of, of the inverse of the even powers for all even numbers. And so, yes. <laughs> and so, uh, he, uh, he computes uh, all these, all these, uh, all these uh, sums, or the sums of all these series. And in fact, this was the, the reason why he decided to look, to look, to look, The Germans have a word for that. I won't say it. Okay. This is what we did. But he did a bit of the arrow. Uh, but we also want to press it here. Every time you see that message, you need to press it on this. Ah. Okay. Yes. Oh, this. So, okay. Okay. I, okay. Right. But this. Uh, put in word. Okay. I'm sorry about this. This is getting weird. But uh, so this naturally uh, led him to consider the properties of this function, the, the zeta function. So uh, uh, when you you substitute here just uh, even integers for an arbitrary uh, real number. Uh, so this series converges absolutely and uh, uh, locally uniformly for for real s bigger than one. Of course, for s equals one, it diverges because it's it's just your more geometric series. But and so this is uh, this is the what Paul set out to solve, and he uh, the, he managed to prove a wonderful theorem, which is uh, called the Euler product for the zeta function, which is this. Uh, so this is wonderful. This is a, a beautiful uh, and unexpected relation because it tells you that uh, the zeta function is equal to the products over all primes. So this is a bit strange because if you look at series, you don't have primes, but then here, here primes, not prime numbers, uh, appear in a, an unexpected way. In fact, uh, you can already get some. Uh, interesting results in number theory because uh, if you consider this, I mean, this is if you consider what happens uh, in the limits when s tends to one, uh, you get infinity of primes because uh, when s tends to one, the zeta function uh, tends to infinity. So if, if the, C, the harmonic series diverges, then of course. Uh, this must diverge as s equals to one, and could not diverge if there were a finite number of primes. Uh, so, uh, so this is it. Uh, I will make yes. Uh, may I just make a comment? Yeah, sure. Uh, that uh, quality uses in a fundamental way the unique factorization theorem. Yeah. And Harvey said that this is the analytic form of the unique factorization. Yeah, 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 makes sense. Let me show you how Euler did it. Okay, so it is very, I mean, this is the only proof I'm going to show you. Uh, but it is so beautiful that I cannot use it. So basically, what you have, uh, right. no, I'm not your help. Uh, certainly, I'll, I'll just attend to some. So, what you have is if you write out the z function. For s greater than one, thank you. Uh, for s greater than one, let me just write out a few more terms. Mm. And now, uh, you, this is a beautiful, beautiful thing. So, if you write this in one over two ds, this becomes and I'll write, I'll write this series as this. One over two ds. So you get the, the powers of two, right? You get just the powers of two. You get, you get one over two to the s of this. You get only the the powers of two, the, the even, the powers of the even numbers. Sorry. 
So what happens when you take this difference, if you take this difference, is that 1 minus 1 over 2 ds times the z function is equal to, now you subtract these things off, and you get and you get just the odds the odd powers. Okay? Now you do exactly the same trick, the same thing with the next prime number, which is three. And so I won't make a calculation. This is a completely uh, similar calculation. But now this kills off all powers of three. So what happens is that we get one plus one. I said, and so on and so forth. Well, and now you see the, the you see the pattern. So if you do this for all primes, what happens because of the unique factorization here is that you kill off everything. And so what you get is this. Equals times zeta equals y, which is the oil problem. So this is <laughs> this is a very good, a very beautiful proof. But uh, this is exactly how I did it. And so, uh, and so this is the other proof I'll present here in the in this seminar. Okay. So this is oil. Uh, then in the uh, in 1859, uh, Riemann uh, considered the zeta function. But now with the complex variable. And so what happens is in a, in a complex variable is that the, the zeta function, well, you may ask, oh, the zeta function is not defined as, as s equals one. How, how can you do it? Okay, let's do it slowly. So you define, first, you define the zeta function by the series, and you may see that it converges for the real power of s greater than one. And then, uh, and then for for real parts, well, if it converges, it has the the other, the other product representation. Uh, now, how do you extend the, the, the zeta function to the rest of the plane? Well, first of all, there is a singularity pole, an ordered one pole at s equals one. So this is this you cannot escape. But then, what you do is that by the trick. Which I won't go into, but I did show it. Then you can extend the zeta function to the strip between zero and one. And now, what happens is another second miracle uh, at the same uh, level that the at the same level as the Euler product, which is the functional equation for the Riemann function, which is this. Okay, so uh, the zeta function, uh, oil, uh, Riemann proved that the zeta function satisfies this functional equation. This relates the, the value at the, at the point s to a value with a value at the point 1 minus s. So this means that, in fact, if you know the zeta function, well, I'm sorry, if, uh, if you know that, no, that there's no need. Okay. This means that if you know the, the zeta function uh, at a point uh, uh, beyond one half, then you can, this, this is a, by, by this symmetry, by the symmetry by the functional equation, you know it at a point symmetric with respect to the two real, par real particles, one half. Um, and now this is an identity between meromorphic functions. And this allows for the holomorphic extension of the zeta function to the other side of the complex plane. Just to give you an idea, well, uh, just to give you an idea what's, what this means. Now, for instance, we can uh, simply calculate what uh, compute. We, remember, we know the zeta function to the right of zero in a half plane, uh, real part of the zero. Now, <laughs> the, the, the functional equation uh, allows us to compute to the left of zero, uh, the, the left half plane. It, for instance, 
uh, if you try to compute zeta of minus one, the functional equation, you just substitute s by s with minus one here. And what you what you get is that you get the sign of the you get all this. This gamma of two, of course, is one. Uh, zeta of two is, is the Basel problem. <laughs> so uh, what you get is minus one over two. This has been uh, made a viral video about mathematics. I say that this this divergent series sums to minus one over twelve, which is exactly what is going on here. If you accept divergent series, right? But you don't need divergent series. You just this is a, a holomorphic extension. So the zeros of the zeta function will be this. Uh, so what about the zeros? I'll tell you some. Uh, basic properties of the zeros. First, uh, zeta is zero free in the uh, half plane uh, with real part greater than one. This is relatively easy. Uh, from the functional equation, it has single zeros at the even negative integers. Why? Well, if you look at the, because of the sign there, okay? Because of the sign. If you look at uh, the sign, then, uh, Okay, so these are called the trivial zeros. Uh, this, this is immediate from the equations. Uh, so if you don't have uh, zeros on the right half plane and on the uh, greater than one and on the left half plane, smaller than zero, you only have this trivial zero, then all the other zeros must be concentrated on the strip between zero and one, on the vertical strip between zero and one. This is called the critical strip. So, and this is what happens. Now, it's important, it will be important to understand the structure of the zeros. So, you, here you have the trivial zeros, here you have the zero free region, and then in the critical, you have zeros, which a priori you don't know where they are, but you know they have uh, special symmetry problems. They must come in packs of four. For instance, if you have a zero here, then my functional equation must be accompanied by another zero here. But because of this Fabrician Fabrician symmetry property, these must be accompanied by zeros here as well. So uh, a zero off the critical line comes in a pack of four. Of course, if this is on the critical line, uh, which is which is the, the axis of, uh, of symmetry of the functional equation, uh, real part equals one half, if, if the zeros are lie on the critical line, then, uh, of course, this symmetry of the functional equation tells you nothing, and you just have pairs, not packs of four, but packs of two zeros on the critical one, on uh, with uh, positive and negative imaginary parts. So, first view of the of the Riemann conjecture, and I will explain why it is why it is so. Um, all the non-trivial zeros lie on the critical line. But this is the Riemann hypothesis. I'm going to, to work toward, towards understanding why <laughs> this is hypothesis, how it, how it appears and why it, it is important. So basically, uh, it says that all zeros are here. So you don't have zeros off the critical line, those which would have come in a pattern form. OK. Now, uh, what was the problem Riemann set out to solve, which led him to this, this hypothesis? Uh, okay. Which led him to this hypothesis? Well, he was his objective was to was to uh, to find uh, an exact formula for the primes for the distribution of primes. Not, uh, not, uh, not a better approximation, but an exact formula, compute an exact formula for the primes. So this, is, this was, was his objective. So uh, I'll tell you how he did it, uh, him, how Heyman did it. So he starts to define not uh, another, quite, uh, another counting function, which is not the, the standard, I mean, the, the naive uh, counting function, but this adapted counting function, which counts also powers of primes. So this, for instance, this counts how many squares of primes there is at 20 and divides by one half and so on and so forth. 
So this is a, a, a slightly different uh, counting function. Uh, note that this has no convergence problem because uh, this is for each x, this is a finite sum, right? This is a finite sum. Uh, and so uh, by a standard uh, resulting number theory, this, if you know this big pi of x, then you, you may invert this uh, definition by uh, the so-called Mobius inversion, which uses the Mobius function here, here. So basically, the idea is, if you know this, you know this. I mean, this, this, it is equivalent. It has the same information. Uh, and, now, and now this is Riemann's results in the paper, in that paper. The, the result which, is, which, uh, which he wanted and for, for which the, the Riemann hypothesis was, was, an hypothesis, it was not necessary. It, it is not necessary. So this is an exact formula for the, for the number of, for this pi of x, for the modified counting function. And you see that the first term is y of x, which is, of course, in the prime number theorem, right? This is the first approximation. It is a smooth curve. But then, I'm sorry. But then you have more terms. You have these terms, which, uh, which and this is the sum on the roots of the zeta function. This, this index goes to the roots of the zeta function, the non trivial roots. Uh, you have this correction term. And then you have a constant, and this, this term which vanishes, which goes to zero uh, as x tends to infinity. Okay? So, in fact, what you have, if you ignore these two terms, uh, because they don't matter, they don't really matter, and you, what you have here, and this is monotonic, this is monotonic, this is a constant. So, this term must include, if this is an exact formula, this term must include all the oscillating parts which make convergence to. To the prime counting function. Uh, by the way, this is this this equality here, of course, is in the Fourier series sense because I mean uh, pi of x is a dis uh, discontinuous function. So in quantum dis discontinuity, this converges to the half sum. Uh, and so this is some people call this the Riemann prime number theorem because it is an exact form of uh, of the prime number theorem. This is an exact formula. So it's completely different from anything that exists, existed before. Uh, if you know big pi, you, you know uh, small pi. And well, and now you may, you may wonder where, how come, how do the zeros of zeta uh, appear in this thing, this, this summation? Well, in fact, all these terms correspond to uh, zeros, or the pole in this case, in the, in the, in the, first, in the case of this term, uh, of the zeta function. Why? Because of something in a, because of the Hadamard product for uh, holomorphic functions, complex holomorphic functions. Okay? It is, uh, <laughs> it is, so, so basically you write, you write the zeta function on the left as an other product, on the right as a Hadamard product, and then, and then when you equate does the, the both things. So here you have primes, here you have uh, zeros of zeta. And so um, after some machinery, what happens is that you get the primes on the left and the, the, the zeros of the, of the zeta function here on the right. And the zeros of in each term of these is associated with zeros of the, 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 the zeta function. So this is what I see here. Uh, this is what I see here. Uh, so the, this, this term is uh, monotonic and goes to infinity, of course. Uh, this term is a constant, this term goes to zero, and here is the oscillating part. Now, how can you see the oscillating part? Well, <laughs> uh, um, well, it is in fact not difficult to see. Uh, if you remember the, the observation about the packs of four or packs of two. So that's that. that this term comes from the pole at s equals one. This one is from the zeros in the critical strip. And these two come from the trivial zeros. This is all consequence of the Hadamard of that. So, um, okay, 
So what do you, what do you have? I'll show you the structure of this in a moment, of this summation in a moment. But what you have is basically this. I mean, uh, you have the, here you have the prime counting function, pi of x. And then you see, uh, you see this is the Riemann formula with 35 zeta zero. This is a kind of Fourier expansion. It's not Fourier, it's Riemann expansion. <laughs> Uh, so what you have here is a convergence to the staircase of primes, in fact. And this is an exact formula. What Riemann tells us is that if you include all zeros on the critical strip, you get exactly the prime counting function. Uh, maybe you can uh, uh, change. I hope this works. Uh, you want to show the video? No, not yet, not yet. No, 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 no. This is this is so. This is okay. For, great. So this, this 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 stuff is on the web. I didn't make any calculations. Anymore. Nothing. Uh, so basically, you, I don't know if you can see it, see it, but basically you have a prime counting function, and then you have successive approximations up to n order to the uh, one hundredth harmonic of uh, to the to the to the function. Okay. Uh, now, I'm going to show you what is called the music of the primes, which is this harmonic convergence of the Riemann series. So, uh, what is the structure of the, os the oscillating term? Well, if you remember that the non trivial zeros come in packs of four, symmetric around uh, real particle one and a half, and uh, the imaginary particle to zero, you have packs of you have the following four pack, I mean, this one, and this four pack, uh, if you think of, the, of x to the, to the roots, this four pack uh, gives you, uh, gives rise to terms of this form. One, if you, if you make this, this uh, x to the root as a complex thing, right, uh, complex exponential and so on, what you have is, <laughs> Uh, the real part is this, uh, is x to, to the one half minus alpha k uh, cos of log x plus a term symmetric with respect to one half, uh, which is this. So now if you look at this jointly, then as x tends to infinity, this is just a cosine of a varying uh, frequency times uh, a varying amplitude. And if you, if, you, if you are interested in estimating how this amplitude goes to infinity, well, this, this, these joint terms, of course, the, the term which grows quicker is this one. So the amplitude of the oscillating parts goes with one half plus alpha to the alpha k, where alpha k is the, is the, the, yeah, alpha k is the difference to the critical line of the rules, okay? Of course, uh, if, uh, if, uh, the, the, if alpha k equals zero, which, which means if the zeros lie on the critical line, then of course, here alpha k is zero, here alpha k is zero, and you get the best possible, the best, I mean, the best bound. So if all the, the zeros, if, the, if a zero is zero, is on the critical line that alpha k is zero, and then you have just square root. So this is good. And I'll show you in a moment. So this is basically what happens. These are the these are the waves that each music each sorry, each uh, root corresponds to uh, to uh, a wave of this form. Okay, so varying amplitude, varying frequency with one x, and an amplitude which grows like. Well, like x to the one half plus alpha k. So what happens is that all the roots we know have real particle equal one half. So in fact, this envelope of all the harmonics in the in the Riemann formula grow as x to the one half. This is called the music of the primes. So because you know the Fourier series and so on. But now imagine, imagine that there is one root, one, one root in which 
which has which is off the critical line. So for that root, you will have this term with alpha k different from zero. And so while all the contributions of all the other roots, of all the roots in the critical line, give you 10 to infinity as x to the one half, that specific root will grow quicker. So this is uh, this would destroy the music of the primes. Why? Well, because uh, as x tends to infinity, imagine you have a, a, an orchestra, an orchestra playing, and then all of a sudden uh, there is another, there is one single instrument which which uh, starts playing louder and louder and louder and dwarfs everything else. So that would be the effect of a, of a, a zero of the critical one. Okay. So this is the Riemann hypothesis, I told you. Here it is in the, in the next paper. Uh, and uh, uh, this is the translation of what he was saying. So it, this, is, this is here the hypothesis. It is very probable that all roots are real. Well, real because he was uh, working with the uh, rotation of the zeta function. Uh, one would, however, wish a strict proof of this. I have, though, some flipping attempts. Uh, well, so he didn't do it. Uh, he computed the first three uh, three roots. Uh, now um, I'll try to to, and I'll just show you. So uh, yeah, maybe I can. Okay. So here is the zeta function. This is the the this is the original complex plane. Here you have the here is the the, the original plane, and here on the critical line are all the are the, the roots of the zeta function so and now here what you have here is the image plane and now i will show you what happens as you go up on the critical line so here you have the first root now then you go up the critical line the second root now the third root fourth root fifth root very close to this one and so on and so forth okay so this is what happens uh, the Riemann hypothesis says that all the roots are there okay right okay so let's okay so as i told you the first three zeros were what is the evidence we have uh, from for for the Riemann hypothesis. Well, the first one was is not really evidence. The first three zeros were completed by Riemann uh, before before the paper. But as as you see, he didn't need the Riemann hypothesis for his formula for his exact formula. Uh, now results. There are infinitely many zeros. Of course, this is a hypothesis. This is a very hard problem. It is open. Uh, there are uh, hardly show that there are infinitely many zeros on the critical line. Uh, there have been results always uh, in the sense that more and more of the zeros are on the critical line. The last result I know of is that five fourths of the zeros are on the critical line. <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> yes, 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 of course, of course. Uh, uh, the first 10 to, to the 13 zeros are, have been computing in an R on the critical line. Uh, and uh, Oblisco uh, actually has uh, an algorithm which allows you to compute clusters of, of zeros at any height you want. So I think that the, 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 the last have been computed at around 10 to the 36, and all of them fall into, into the, the critical line. And then there is random mixed theory, which I'll, I'll talk about in a moment. So, uh, of course, for a mathematician, this is no evidence. I mean, we are not engineers, right? So, uh, so you can have ten to the power of what any, anything you want uh, of, of terms on the critical line, and then one destroys it. Also, I mean, this is not just a, a curiosity. I mean, one zero, as I so show you, one zero off the critical line would destroy. The structure of the prime, uh, or who we believe, uh, is the distribution of primes. So it, it, it takes just one uh, root of so of the, the, the critical line. So this is not not uh, uh, not 
not trivial. There are people who, of course, of course, I mean, they, 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 although most mathematicians I know believe uh, in the truth of the Riemann hypothesis, and I think that the question of, you know, the beauty of the distribution of the music of the prime is the best argument. Uh, there are people who uh, don't think it is true. I mean, Little, for instance, uh, said that collaborator of Hardy said that he had been working with uh, Zero for a long time. And he could not uh, think of a reason why it should, this should be true. Uh, sorry? Who? You. Ah, me. Well, yes. <laughs> <laughs> But for the machine, but he's showing both types. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, Alexander Ivich, which he, who is a, a specialist on this thing, has a wonderful paper, uh, mathematical paper. This is not uh, belief. Mathematical paper showing uh, whose title is Reasons Not to Believe on the Riemann Hypothesis. <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> Ivich. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Ivich. Alexander Ivich. Okay, so, so this is not trivial. Okay, so why is the Riemann hypothesis so important? Well, because, because uh, as I showed that gesture, it, it implies that the distribution of primes is best possible. So we have these square root bounds for all, uh, for every single root. And so you have all, all this, all the zeros have the same con the, uh, analogous contributions. You don't get definite sums from the hard, from, from no one, one right? Um, well, uh, and by the way, let me just tell you that uh, to, to get to the beginning, the Hadama and Valle Poussin proof of the prime number theorem was precisely show, to show there are, that there are no zeros on the line R uh, real part equals one. So this is enough, this is sufficient for the prime number theorem, just showing that there are no zeros on the edge of the critical line, uh, strip. Okay, why? There are, why is it important? Because there are literally hundreds of results, either in number theory or in analysis, or in fact, in other fields of mathematics, which are conditional on the Riemann hypothesis. So you may think that this is a, a giant domino thing, if you topple the Riemann hypothesis, hundreds of dominoes topple next, <laughs> instantaneously. <laughs> uh, so yeah, many problems uh, are equivalent, in fact, equivalent to the Riemann hypothesis. Meaning, of course, in particular, that they must be very hard. <laughs> they are very hard. Uh, the Riemann hypothesis appears surprisingly in, in for apparently unrelated contexts. It's happened to me. So if I have to, I say, I don't know if I still have time, but I, I would like to show you what, how I tripped on the Riemann hypothesis in my own research. And it has, uh, there are wide ranging uh, generalizations of the, of the Riemann hypothesis that have deep uh, connections for the fields of mathematics, including the, the Langlands program. I, I'll, I'll be very brief on, on that, but uh, um, uh, it, I, I will do it, do it in a few moments. So I'll just show you <laughs> two very uh, innocent sounding results, which are equivalent, which are shown to be equivalent to the Riemann hypothesis. The first one is that, uh, is that the prime number distribution is actually equal to li of x, which is the first term of the prime number theorem, plus a square root term. Uh, this term, sorry, not the square root, but this term, square root of x log x. In particular, so why is this, now we understand, why is this equivalent to the Riemann hypothesis? Because, because if all the roots have this outlay on the on the critical line, you have a square root, okay, you the square root behavior. And the square and, and, and this, uh, if one of the roots were different, were uh, had real part greater than one half, the corresponding power would be uh, x to the one half plus epsilon. And so this would not be true. 
So this is equivalent to the Riemann hypothesis. Both ways. And the second one is very, <laughs> very curious. This comes from Landau. Uh, well, Landau, yes. And from Landau. Yeah. Uh, which is basically this one. So if you if you construct this new view function, which is basically minus one if the if the if take an integer, an integer, if this, this is minus one if you have an odd number of prime factors, and it is plus one if, if it has uh, uh, an even number of prime factors. Then the Riemann hypothesis is equivalent to this sum, this sum of the of the uh, odds and even number of divisors, um, sorry, of prime factors uh, of regular divided by n to the one half. Is that right? It's zero. So this, you may be look, you may look at this as saying that if you take a, a, an integer at that time, then it has equal probability of having odds, an odd number or an even number of prime factors. This is also very nice. Of course, there are statements which are incredibly thick and difficult to understand in, in any uh, in, in, in many fields. Okay. You know, not, not only number theory, but also analysis. Okay, now I'll, I want to tell you about some other surprising facts. I'm running out of time, but <laughs> okay, some other surprising facts. So uh, if you transform the distributional density of an appropriate version of the Kalman function, you obtain this series. Now, this series, you see that this is closely connected with the cosine of t log pn. So the frequency is the log of the power of prime. So this is what's, what comes in Riemann's, um, in Riemann's uh, approach. Of course, you have this. So what, ha what happens here is a kind of a Fourier expansion. Well, it is a Fourier expansion. Uh, where the frequencies are the powers of the prime. And so if you, if you take this series and, uh, and treat it as, I treat the limit as a distribution, what happens is that uh, the, the spectrum, so to speak, is concentrated at the roots of, uh, at the imaginary parts of the roots of the of the, the, the zeta function. And conversely, <laughs> now this is uh, the interesting thing is that this is a uh, this is a, a, a duality. Conversely, if you take the now if you form this series, which is formally very similar, but now the frequencies now in this series is on the roots of the zeta function, what you what you what happens is that now <laughs> Now the, the distribution has peaks at the primes and the prime powers, right? It peaks in this distribution sense. So these are these are these, these will be delta functions. Of course, this uh, all this 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 is equivalent. This construction is equivalent to the to the Riemann hypothesis, and everything breaks down if the Riemann hypothesis is false. So this is a very beautiful thing. So you see uh, the. the this shows you the connection between the primes and the and the, they are kind of Fourier transforms of each other. Uh, another uh, very amazing, surprising thing about the the, the Riemann zeros uh, is that is is the following. So Polyak conjecture is uh, that one reason why. I, in, in mathematics, there are no coincidences. So if something happens, there must be a good reason for, for that for it to happen. And so Polya conjectured that the reason for the zeros to be in precisely in a line would well, this would happen if this line, for instance, if you have an opera, a linear operator, and uh, if the operator is self-adjoint. Okay, so if the self-adjoint operator, the, the the eigenvalues are real. Okay, so what you would need there, I mean, taking into account rotations and translations of a line, would be to, to have a, a self-adjoint operator associated 
in some sense to the zeta function. So this, this is a conjecture, of course, it has not been proven, but something very strange happens uh, meantime. So uh, in 72, Montgomery, Hugh Montgomery, uh, showed that the pair correlation function between zeros uh, of the zeta function behaves like this. Okay, so this is, seems, seems not to, but Freeman Dyson uh, pointed out that this correlation is precisely what happens for random Hermitian matrices, right? So this is very weird. You get exactly the same distribution of eigenvalues um, for eigen, uh, of, of values, sorry, for the zeros of the Z function or eigenvalues of Hermitian matrices, random Hermitian matrices. And here you see, you see what the, uh, and, and Dyson also noticed that this is also the distribution for spectra of atomic nuclei. This is very strange. So here you see the, the spacing of different kinds of, of, uh, of, of values. So here you see, let me, let me see, I'll, I'll take this later, but let me just, you don't have random? Oh yeah, this is periodic, of course. All the, the, the lines are equal. This is a random distribution. And in fact, this is an atomic nucleus. This is the eigenvalues of, of and these are the zeta zeros. These are these have the same distributions. Why does that happen? I mean, there must be a reason for that. Nobody knows. Uh, and I mean, uh, maybe the random matrices uh, control everything. Maybe these are three different instances of the same thing. I mean, if this happens, it cannot be by it cannot be a plan. <laughs> so uh, here, Odlisko uh, in the 90s constructed precisely uh, the, uh, the, the zeta zero distributions. And this follows to an incredible extent that of the Gaussian, the Jagen values of the Gaussian mean and then So this is this is amazing if you think that these, these curves represent something like 10 to the 12 uh, zeros or eigenvalues. So they coincide, the curves coincide. And so possibly we are looking at the same thing. Okay, so why uh, more, more, I mean, so this is very, <laughs> uh, an open problem, very open, pro very difficult problem coming to the end. Uh, but just to tell you that this is not the end of the story. I mean, there, there are other, I mean, in mathematics, it's, it's a uh, normal thing to do when you cannot solve a problem. Maybe you put it in a wider context, and then you solve uh, the wider problem of this is of, of which this is a, a specific instance. I mean, think of group theory. I mean, the, the equation of fifth degree, right? <laughs> so uh, what happens is that you can construct uh, Dirichlet series with Dirichlet characters. Uh, and uh, you can construct the corresponding, the corresponding, uh, so to speak, zeta function, which is this. This is uh, something, an object called Z, uh, L function. And so this function, because uh, because this is a character, this function satisfies an oil product, uh, formally similar to the oil product from the zeta from normal here. And it also satisfies a functional equation. And so you have the two ingredients of the zeta of the Riemann zeta function, and you play the same game. And of course, you have this conjecture that all zeros of these functions lie on the critical line. You can play the same thing again for algebraic objects. I mean, this uh, the dedicated the zeta function on, uh, on number fields, and again, this satisfies. Uh, an oil product and a functional equation, you play the same game, holomorphic extension, blah, 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 and conjecture Riemann hypothesis. And finally, you have the grand Riemann hypothesis, which is something, <laughs> uh, which is something which I, I will, of course, not talk about, 
at all, uh, which extends to the, to, to the realm of topological functions. Now, well, these functions also satisfy our, our problem and functional equation, and they also set conjecture to satisfy the Riemann hypothesis. Uh, let me just show you. Uh, I mean, this is a whole world of stuff, right? So here you have kind of data that is a model for this describes everything you want to know about about uh, uh, well about uh, these L functions and model forms uh, and uh, well the first the, the 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 simplest example of which is the Riemann zeta function which is here okay so here you have the characterization so the, what is the purpose of this database the idea is that you have kind of cooperatively, you have this, this knowledge about L functions, and maybe some mathematician which is wondering about uh, it spots a pattern between some L functions or whatever, which gives you a hint how to prove some Riemann hypothesis. <laughs> okay, so I, I, I will not go into this. This is about, this is uh, probably less interesting it's to describe how i came how my research led me to the <laughs> the riemann hypothesis um i was working with with uh, uh positive objects called positive with functions and uh and so on and so on i won't go i won't go into this uh i'll just tell you that uh, uh we <laughs> so we me and my colleague by shown Dr. Bachel, we uh, got into a, well, we, we didn't start out working on zeta function. It just appeared out of nowhere. And uh, years later, we found our own version of a sufficient condition to the Riemann hypothesis. Of course, we won't solve it, but that's not a problem. <laughs> okay. Uh, and finally, thank you very much. So oh, please, uh, if you have question, please, uh, uh, or either you ask on the chat or you just uh, put your mic on and ask your question for people who are uh, removed. Uh, no, 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 we have no question in the chat, but maybe we have a question here in the, in the audience. Students are all uh, welcome, very welcome to ask their questions. Can you tell us what's the district with this character? Yeah, yeah. I mean, this, this is a character function in which, uh, so it is basically a function from uh, the universe to the unit circle. In which the uh, which makes this uh, well we, we, these are periodic so something like this and so they are basically the functions into the, the from the integers to the circle which make this function an arithmetic function. And this it is the fact that this is an arithmetic function, function in this sense that uh, that gives you the other product. Yeah. So this is periodic, and this is this is the, the, the this, this is the property that gives you the other product. It makes everything work. If you because if you take an arbitrary Dish Lake series, something like this, with arbitrary coefficients here. That this will not, this will in general not be, uh, this will be in general not have a, an oil product, not at all. But for, uh, for L functions, for Dirichlet L functions, like this, if the coefficients are characters, then it gives you uh, uh, an oil product, and then they, you have all the rest of the machinery. Yeah? It's a homomorphism given all this class and that and it's a form. Uh they use this before people. Yes. And it will pass it from one plane cloud with 
where this monetary duality, where this not exactly this notion of characters is duality. Mm -hmm. So the characters are T1, the set of characters is T1, is the dual of C, which contradict me to what you know. Sorry, I. The, the, the unit circle, the torus T1, is the quantitative uh, dual of the Z. Yeah. yeah. So it's a set of. Mm -hmm. characters. So there is a doubt for what we found that to be in groups by quantitating, and uh, so each union what we found that to be in group is a dual. And the dual of C is the set of characters on C, it's a dual line, let's say. It's uh -huh. okay. and good, we have time for one more question. Or in the beginning, yes, we were away from the one half. <laughs> so, uh, if there are no more questions, uh, we will thank Jean again. Thank you.